We are very excited to have Scott Klusowski with us today. He is a visionary technology architect who helps organizations position themselves to win in the market through the consulting firm he founded, Future Point of View. His latest startup is Crowdscribed, a new paradigm in crowd-generated book publishing that reverses the entire publishing process in order to take the risk out of the traditional publishing model. Scott will challenge your thinking, translate complicated concepts into layman's terms, and get your creative juices flowing. Please help me welcome Scott Klusowski. Let me tell you a digital transformation story. Uh, and this is, a, this is a story about Mafia 1.0 to Mafia 2.0. So two days ago, I get a call from uh, the CFO of a large steel company. And uh, he says, well, we need some help with cybersecurity. And uh, the reason is we just wired out $50,000 uh, in a scam that, if you're familiar with it, it's called the CEO scam, where uh, when a CEO or a CFO leaves town, uh, somebody in organized crime will send a spoofed email, right, an email that comes from the address of a CFO or the CEO to one of the controllers or somebody in accounting, and they'll say, hey, we need to wire out money for this deal. Uh, and then if you wire the money out, you're actually wiring it out to a Chinese bank account where you're never going to see it again. And so, uh, it, it's not unusual that I would get a call that somebody's wired out this amount of money. And by the way, there have been companies that have wired up to $7 million out in this scheme, right? The $50,000 is just the first wire, and if you fall for that one, then they try to send you another request for more money. So, he tells me the story. It's not interesting so far, but then it gets interesting because he said, the, the, the thing was, we know about this scheme. And we still wired the money out. And the reason is, even though we told people that you can't wire the money without a verbal confirmation because you can't trust the emails, the person, the controller in this department who got this, uh, who got this email tried to call the CFO. CFO was on vacation, which is the way the scam actually works. Tried to call somebody else. They were out of town. And so he thought he was doing the right thing, and he just wired the money out. The group that actually does this CEO scheme is the Greek Mafia out of Canada. And so far, it's estimated that they've been able to get $1.6 billion, billion dollars, by getting people to wire money out. That is the digital transformation from Mafia 1.0 to Mafia 2.0. You know, I, I'm, I'm fascinated by what technology does. I've spent my whole career in the technology space. I've spent a lot of that time building companies. Uh, but I've spent the last decade or so just working with executives on how do you use technology to win in the market. And so uh, I, I, this transformation that we're going through, which I want to talk a bit more about with you, uh, is, is fascinating to me because I don't think we really understand I mean, we're living in the middle of it, and because we're living in the middle of it, I don't think we have great context for how much it's actually changing things. And so what I wanted to share with you a little bit today are just some thoughts just to try to open up your minds a little bit about this time we are living in right now and what's really going on. When you hear the words digital transformation, the way I want you to think about it is that it is a time in history. And so, you go forward a couple hundred years and historians or history teachers are talking to their students, they're going to explain that, yeah, there was this time in history, right? It was from 2000 to roughly, let's say, 2050. And during this time, human beings and technology integrated at a level that had never been seen. And that digital transformation changed humanity more than any other time, more than any other time. And that's what I think is a little difficult for us to understand because we're living right in the middle of it. So we lose context to the fact. Now we know, especially those of us who are older, we know how much things have changed from when we were younger to now. But we are absolutely losing context for how much more change is going to come, uh, much less in a business sense how to leverage it. So, so let's talk about this digital transformation in a second. If you're a history teacher 200 years from now and you're talking to young people, uh, you're going to say, look, 
There was before the internet and after the internet. And, and before the internet, it was like the dark ages, right? There was nothing that was connected. Everything was isolated. Whereas today, everything is connected. Organizations are connected to their customers electronically. People are connected to each other. Uh, devices are all connected now. And the young people are going to say, oh my gosh, you know, how could, uh, how could people even have survived in that time? And, and we can go through and look at all these things that are historically significant. Like today, we don't think much about how everything is becoming connected and how much, how much that changes the world when data flows across the world. Or we don't look at things such as mobile devices. I mean, we're all carrying mobile devices today, right? And, and it's funny because it can look out at any audience. Uh-huh, yeah. And the whole time I'm talking, there will be people that are on their devices. Now, they could be taking notes, yeah? They could be tweeting, best speaker I've ever heard, all right? Who knows? But it's amazing how addicted we've become to these things already. Now, what we have to understand is this is just a first step. It's a first step. We're going to move from mobile to wearables to implantables. And I know it's, it's a hard thought for some people to think about it. we're going to be implanting technology so that we can connect better to technology, but we will. But let's just talk about mobile for a second. Today, these devices are like outboard brains. So that's what psychologists say. They're like outboard brains. So they do three things for us. One is they store memory. So you don't have to remember telephone numbers, right, or birth dates or addresses anymore because you can put them in here. And then this stores it for you. So it, it augments your brain's memory. Second thing, it solves problems for you. So you know, when you have an issue and you need to solve a problem, I need to find a hospital, right, or I need to find a Thai food restaurant, right? you can go to this device and the device solves the problem for you. Or the third thing is it's access to huge amounts of information. So it used to be when we had to reach the information quickly, we just reached here. It was all we had. Whatever you had, it's what you had. But today you have this and you have this. And you can instantly reach to this and you can tap into much more information than you have here. And in fact, most of you probably realize, a lot of these devices now, they're starting to try to know you, know where you drive, know what you do and at what times a day, know how many steps you take, know who you talk to a lot. And these devices now try to outthink you. Right? They try to go in front of you and try to pave the way. When I get in my car to go to church on Sunday mornings, I can look down at my device and it tells me how long it's going to take for me to get to church. And the wild thing for me is I'm thinking, how do you know? How do you know that I'm headed to church? I never told you, but it knows. It's like an outboard brain. And we've become incredibly addicted to it already. And when you think in terms, again, of history and historical changes, and you think about the fact, go back 20, 30 years. If you showed somebody 30 years ago the power we would have with a mobile device, it would seem magical to them and we're not even close to being done, right? Well, like I said, we'll move to wearables, we'll move to implantables. When we move to implantables, obviously we're gonna integrate with technology at a much higher level. Here you go. Taking notes. taking notes. He was taking notes. All right, or if we look at history, and we think about data and information and how much of it is being created and how much of it is flowing around and how much this changes us, now, I, I don't think we have an appreciation for the fact that we have been pretty blind most of our life. I mean, we've been pretty blind to the things that are going on around us. But when you can start gathering data and information from everything, it creates insight. It creates visibility. It allows you to see analytics or see things that you've never been able to see before. Now, one, of the, one of the workshops I'm going to do here today is all on data and, and what data is doing to us today. But there's good things and bad things about all the information flowing around us. You know, it's wonderful that in a business sense, we can see things we've never been able to see before about our customers, right, or about our performance or our products. But we can look at the human cost of flowing information everywhere. I saw a study not too long ago, and I was curious. I had looked up what was, what was the average age that a child sees porn. And I found a study that showed 
that the average age has dropped from 13 years old to 8 years old in the last five years. Ponder that for a second, that one of the things we get when we're flowing information around the way we are on the internet now is that the average age somebody sees porn is eight years old. Or think about the historical significance of frictionless communication, the fact that anyone can communicate with anyone else in the world instantly and for free. And we have never had this before in humanity, this capability that any one of us could talk to anyone anywhere in the world, or any one of us could talk to a million people instantly and for free. And we've never had that kind of capability before. Or think about the historical significance of how relationships are changed by digital. You know, I, I, there's two sides of this, right? There's business relationships, so there's how do we find new customers, how do we nurture the customer relationships. In a lot of cases, digital is being woven into that much more through digital marketing, right, or digital relationship building. And so that's obviously changing how businesses sell or how they connect with people. And then we have the human side of this, you know, how people are finding their, their dates or finding their spouses. And uh, it's interesting, we have a young guy in our office, his name's Matt, Matt's about 30, and uh, we were talking about this one day, and we got to talking about Tinder, and Matt says, oh yeah, yeah I use Tinder. And I said, really? Uh, so how's it working for you? And he said, oh, you know, it's, it's really pretty good, you know, uh, I've gotten uh, 20 dates from Tinder. And I said, well, 20 dates in what kind of time frame? And he said, well, over the last two months. I'm like, you're kidding me. 20 dates in two months. And he says, yeah. It, 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 like, it's no big deal. And I looked at him and I was like, Matt, you realize I've never been on 20 dates in my entire life. And it, 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 because we didn't have these kinds of tools where we could swipe right or swipe left. Or think about the historical significance of automation. I mean, robotics, but then also software automation. And how it is replacing jobs that humans used to do. And, and if you look forward, there's, uh, there's some futurists that are predicting that in the next 20 years, we'll lose 35% of the, all the jobs today done by humans. Now, I don't know if that number's right or not, but, but if you just think if it's close, what will 35% of the people today be doing? I mean, if they're not doing their current jobs, what will they move to? And what kind of impact will they have on us? And this gets to be interesting because if you have a utopian view of the world, that then you look at it and you say, well, these people will be freed up to do things that are more interesting for humans to do. Or if you have a dystopian view of the world, you'll say, okay, well, the economies will crash because how are people going to make money if uh, machines are replacing all their jobs? But it's very interesting because today we seem to only have this dystopian view of the future. Like if you watch movies or you read science fiction books, almost all of them, all you can see is a dark post-apocalyptic future. Right, the Matrix, you know, or uh, any of the movies like that that show um, Terminator, right, for instance, that show this kind of future. The big thing to understand is that this is all a historically significant time. When we say the words digital transformation, we don't mean you got a new iPhone. I mean, we mean that humanity is being changed in a massive way. There's a term called humology. So, humology just describes the integrations of humans and technology to get something done. And so, you can look at humology uh, on any process or system, right? And you can say, well, how far over towards the human side was it, or how far is it over towards the technology side? Because it, usually things aren't all the way on one side or all the way on the other. They're usually a bit of a combination. And so, there's actually a scale that you can look at. Uh, that helps you put vocabulary around how much human or how much technology something is using. And we'll use this scale to be able to rate where organizations are or to be able to rate where a certain process is. So if we talk about a hiring process or a sales process or even a manufacturing process, we'll look at it and say, well, that's an H3 or it's a T1. And it helps us to denote how much human versus technology is being used. So for those of you who are leaders, this is an important concept to understand because it gives you a way to talk about, well, where is our organization or where is, it, where is a certain process and where should it be? 
when we ask organizations to just, just to rate yourself, typically they'll say we're an H2 or an H3. In other words, if we look at everything we do, we're a little bit more using humans than technology. And then we'll say, well, where do you think you'll be in five to ten years? And they will typically jump over to T1. And then, of course, we'll say, all right, so what will be the difference? I mean, what will be electronified, right, or digitized that is not today? But if you go all the way over to the T5 side, obviously we have whole companies that are way over on that side. You know, Amazon is a good example of that. Uh, if I ask, how many people here have bought something from Amazon? Raise your hand if you bought something from Amazon. Yeah, almost everybody. How many people here talk to an Amazon sales rep? There's all, yeah, just a few. So the vast majority of the billions of dollars of business that they do is done through a screen right, with no human involvement. And Jeff Bezos has robots that move brown boxes in the warehouse. He wants to send drones around to deliver packages. Right, so Jeff Bezos has made a choice that he wants to be as far over into the T side as he possibly can. There are processes that are completely over into that side. You know, if you do online check-in of a hotel, right, or an airline or anything else, I mean, anymore that process is almost 100% electronic. Now, there's nothing good or bad on this scale. So, I mean, I want you to understand it isn't like we're saying H is bad and T is good. It's just a way to actually measure. And, and if we go over to the H side, you can see that there are some things that are completely human, and none of these things are bad. But I just want you to understand the concept of humology and the scale, because if you're going to understand digital transformation, then you've got to understand how everything is shifting. All right, one other thing I'll tell you, if this will help you, is there's some of you that are taking pictures of slides. You don't need to do that. At the end, I'll give you a, a way that you can get a copy of this presentation. So it's fine if you want to take pictures, I don't care. But if you want to save yourself the trouble, I'll give you a website and you can go download this presentation. That way you don't have to try to take pictures of it. And I'm, you're, I'm glad for you to use the content any way you want. All right, so here's why this is important. This is an interesting little statistic uh, that, that talks about AT&T versus Google. And, and what it's looking at is, if you look in today's dollars, AT&T, go back to the 60s, Right, was worth about $267 billion, but it took 758,000 employees to get there. And then look at Google today. It's worth more money, but with only 55,000 employees. I mean, this is what we have to understand about digital transformation, what we have to understand about humology, is that during this 50-year time, we will replace much of the activities that humans do with technology options. And again, then we have to debate whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, but it, economically it's going to happen. So there are some people that are saying, and I, I, I really quite agree with this, that the information age is over, right? So the information age started with mainframes, but that the information age is over now. And we are now moving into a new age, which they call the age of entanglement. And what's being entangled is humans and technology. And that that's really what we'll see from this point forward, is this, this integration of humans and technology to get things done. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but there was, there was a professor whose name was Kondratiev. And Kondratiev postulated that when we invented certain major improvements that, that would drive economic benefit for some years, but that these things went in cycles. And so, I, 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 this is actually showing Kondratiev waves against the S&P. And it's basically just showing, you know, when you had certain inventions of things like steel or the oil industry or automobiles, right, you drove a lot of prosperity for a while, but then you dropped off into a depression or recession and it came back. Now, typically the way you see Kondratiev's work is like this. Right? I mean, they show like waves. I just wanted to show you it against real S&P data, but it's drawn like this. Now, the interesting thing I want you to understand, the last wave hit the bottom in 2008, 9, 10. And so now we're on an upswing. And so the question is, what will be the invention, right, or what will be the thing that drives this next Kondratiev wave? 
a lot of us believe that it will now be the integration of humans and technology that will drive that. It's not going to be uh, nanotechnology or biotechnology, right, or any magic thing like that that drives it. It's going to much more be how human beings integrate with technology to create this. This is a big part of the digital transformation, is this integration. Now, let's talk about what the economic impact of that is. There's a term called digital Darwinism. Digital Darwinism states when, a, when a, an organization uh, does not move fast enough to get digital maturity and to get through the transformation, then it becomes survival of the fittest and they die off. And so, if you go back to kind of 1980 and you said, well, we got PCs and then we got email and then we got the web and we got cloud computing, we got mobile devices, we got social technologies, we got Internet of Things, right? Every time we add on new technologies, the, the chances that we will impact an industry grow. And so every industry now is somewhere along a curve of hitting what's called the inflection point or the inflection window. And the inflection point or the inflection window is when enough technology comes together that it radically changes an industry and the industry is never the same after that. It becomes, you know, what, what we would say is the new normal. The other thing we see, of course, is some organizations go into the death spiral after this. Some organizations get digital maturity and they win. Now, obviously, I study these things and have studied these for a while. Now, back in the mid-90s, when we got e-commerce and airlines could sell directly to travelers, we lost two-thirds of the travel agents in the United States. But what happened to Kodak? I mean, we all know the story there. They, they had patents on digital photography. They had patents on it, yet they couldn't change fast enough to be able to save themselves. I mean, what happened to Blockbuster? I mean, they watched Netflix come up and take away their market, and Blockbuster literally just laid down and died. We could go on and on. I mean, how many different organizations have we seen, right, that, that have not? If you look at Kodak, though, you talk about winners and losers. The amazing thing to me, Kodak filed bankruptcy in the year 2013. In the same year, Instagram sold to Facebook. Now, Instagram sold to Facebook for a billion dollars. Anybody remember how many employees they had? Just to give you a comparison, close, it was 13. 13 employees, right, when they sold for a billion dollars. Kodak had 125,000 employees at their peak. Right? So this digital Darwinism has been going on, by the way, since the late 90s. Yet here we are in 2016, you know, in the middle of this transformation, and we still have organizations who do not understand what happens when they hit this inflection point. Gaming is no different. Gaming is no different. And, and the interesting question to ask yourselves is, okay, so where is the gaming space on this curve? Because I, I would argue, you know, you're somewhere probably getting close to that inflection point, but you haven't really hit it yet. Now, here's the reason this is tough. All right, so I can point all of this out, and a lot of leaders say, okay, great, I understand all of that. You haven't told me anything new. Here's the problem that we see when we're trying to work with organizations. If you look at the pace of technology change, the pace changes exponentially. In other words, there's more and more new technology all the time. The pace that organizations change is typically logarithmically, and there's two reasons for this. One is, as they get bigger, they get more bureaucratic. And so as they get more bureaucratic, they slow down. They naturally cannot make decisions quick enough anymore. If they're successful, then they tend to do what they did last year. So they go, I mean, we had a great year this year. What do we do? Okay, let's do more of that. So those two things, getting bigger and bureaucratic, being successful and trying to repeat what you did last year, tend to slow down, right? So this creates what's called a strategy risk gap. So this is the gap between what you could be doing with technology and what you are doing with technology. That's the gap. Or I could portray it a different way. I could say this is kind of the leadership legacy zone. 
You know, in our opinion, this is where good leaders separate themselves. And I don't just mean CEOs, by the way. You know, most of you that are in this room today, you're leaders, and, I, and I'm trying to talk to you as such. You're making decisions all the time about strategies of the organization, at least you are in your area. A good leader today understands how to close this gap. That's the legacy that they will leave. A bad leader, they move too slow. They don't understand what's coming in the future. They don't invest their resources in the right way. So this is the problem, right? This is the dilemma that we see, is that gap between what you could be doing and what you are doing. So it brings up this topic of, of transformational leaders, of the fact that today, if you're in a leadership position, you're not just leading, you have to be what's called a transformational leader, and that's different. So if you look in history, you know, Winston Churchill was a transformational leader. He, he led England through a very difficult time during World War II. He might not have been a great leader before or after, but during World War II, he was a fantastic model of a leader that got them through a terrible transformation. Abraham Lincoln in the United States, transformational leader, got us from point A to point B through a very difficult time. So, a couple things for you to think about. First of all, how much of a transformational leader are you, or, or are you just a leader? It's not bad to be just a leader, but you're living in a time of transformation. Certainly, you can't ignore what's going on right now with technology. And so, are you a transformational leader? Now, the other thing to ask yourself are, are questions like this. In your organization, who do you think the best transformational leader is? I mean, if you just had to ask yourself, who? And if you were really honest with yourself, can you name anybody? I mean, is there anybody that you would point to and say, man, they are fantastic at being able to look into the future, make the proper investments, make sure, right, that we are using the technologies that are available? Because if you look around your organization and you can't see somebody, hopefully more than one, that's a good transformational leader, obviously that's a bit dangerous. Or if you ask yourself this question, who in the gaming space in general is one of the best transformational leaders? So just for fun, we're going to play a game called How Smart is the Person Next to You? And the way this game's going to work is I just want you to look at the person next to you, and I want you to tell them who you think the best transformational leader is right now in the gaming space, right? Just give them a name of who you think the best transformational leader is and why, and we'll see how smart your neighbor is. I'm going to give you like a minute. Ready? Go. All right, sir, this is why you have to sit with other people, okay? So this is why, when you're an introvert and you sit all by yourself on purpose, this is a problem. You can't play this game. How smart is your neighbor? Now, what's going to happen if I play it again later? It's going to be a problem for you. But I understand. I, I, I can relate. Here's the, here's the problem that we see, and, and, and I want you to understand a little bit more about what I do. So uh, I, I run a firm called Future Point of View, and so I spend my time going in and out of organizations studying how are they using technology. Typically, I work with the C-suite executives. And so we're always going in and working with somebody who might be the number one or might be the number five, six, or seven player in their industry as far as technology and how they use technology. And so I get a lot of experience with working with leaders and seeing do they really understand what's going on? Do, you know, when we talk about big data, do they really understand how to use data as a weapon? If we talk about digital marketing, do they have any idea what digital marketing is? 
Have they built their personas? Have they built relationship journey maps? I mean, have they done the work to actually do digital marketing in the right way? And you might sense I'm a bit frustrated because I don't understand how we could be this far along into the transformation, 16 years, maybe 20 years into this transformation, and we still have people in leadership positions who really don't seem to understand how to use technology as a weapon in the market, right, or a tool in the market. We have so many of them that just want to copy what everybody else does. Well, I'm going to wait until somebody else shows me how to do this, and then we're going to jump in and copy it. If you want to be a powerful leader, you've got to be high beam. Right? You have to have your high beams out. You have to understand the kinds of things that are coming next. It's no different in the gaming space than in the other space. Right? This is an industry. Right? There is value to being an early mover on something because you get market share when you do that. Or you lower your costs faster than your competitors do. There's value to being able to see over the horizon. Or, or what I would say, having preemptive knowledge of technology. Or we think about things like this. You, you, tomorrow, you fight for tomorrow today. And, and I don't think a lot of leaders, I don't think they understand that, that you, you're fighting for your survival tomorrow by what you invest in today. What kind of culture you build, what kind of people you hire, what kind of strategies you lay in, you know, what kind of investments you make. You fight for tomorrow today. And it is clearly true with technology. But, but too often, you know, what we see is kind of low beam leadership, right? And, and I don't want you to think again that low beam leadership is bad. Low beam leadership is typically called management, right? That's what managers are. Managers still manage people, but they're not responsible for having a vision. They're not responsible for being able to see out five to ten years. They execute on a strategy that a leader gives them. That's low beam leadership. But again, that's for a manager. If you are truly in a leadership position, then you have that unique responsibility of having to have a vision and then having to be able to get everybody to go along with that vision. You've got to be able to invest in that vision and you have to try to get there competitively before the rest of the market, or at least most of the market. That's being high beam. Now, technology provides the perfect fodder for seeing if you're high beam. So, for instance, you know, if we look at this uh, Amazon product, right? So, Amazon has come out with this uh, new device called Amazon Dash. Hopefully, some of you have this. It's just a button, right? How many people have one of these? I'm just curious. A few of you? Okay. For the rest of you, it's just a button, that, that, and they've got over 100 now from different vendors, but you put the button somewhere in your house. It connects to your wireless system, by the way. When you hit the button, it reorders whatever you've set your re re reorder to be. And so, you know, like the Tide one that you see there, you put that by your washing machine, and then when you see that your Tide detergent's getting low, you hit the button, the next day Tide detergent shows up. Now, if you're high beam, you can look at this and say, well, what is this? This is just is a simpler way to do a transaction, right? They're just trying to push the, the limits of trying to make a transaction simple. And if I said, okay, well, where do you think this will go next? Where will it go next? Well, why would you put the Tide thing on a washing machine separately, right? You just, what will happen is LG will come out with a washing machine where you just put the Tide soap in a drawer and the drawer has got is, you know, a scale. And when the scale gets below a certain amount of weight, it'll just automatically reorder and replenish, right? So your washing machine will reorder on its own. I mean, that would be the next step. And so you'll start seeing more and more of the things in your house have knowledge, intelligence, your refrigerator, whatever, where they'll reorder on their own, right? This is, this is a good example of the world of the Internet of Things. But this is what high beam people need to do, and what, what I'm asking you is, what transactions do you do, right, that, that would be simpler if you could just press a button, right? Or the transaction could be automated based on your preferences. We have had automated replenishment in the B2B side for years. In other words, we've signed agreements where as soon as our stock inventory gets low, it automatically gets replenished. We've done that for years in the business side. But now we've taken this concept down to the consumer side. So if you're high beam, you'll understand, right, how, how, to, how to make this work. But let's look at something closer to the gaming space. What we're building here is a computer that can learn. So this is Baby. She's sort of looking at us and hearing us. So if I make a loud noise, you know, she'll get a fright. 
this is what she can see. So you can see my face here. I see that. Right, so she's not copying my smile, she's responding to me. And now this is her little first baby's first word book. So you can pick a, pick a page, you know, show her something, but she has to be looking at it. So get her attention. Hi, baby. Hi. 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 What do you see? What's this? Puppy. Puppy. Very okay, good. good. What's that, baby? Apple. What do you see, baby? Sheep. Sheep. Very good, baby. <laughs> what I'm going to do is now is remove her face, basically. And so this is what's driving oh. in the background. <laughs> and so what you're looking at now, these are all the connections lighting up, right, as the baby's doing stuff. And this is like a simulation of what would yeah, be happening in a person's with, brain. Yeah. Now we take this stuff and we now connect it to cognitive computing systems. So you've got biological neural networks connected to artificial intelligence models, and the potential for that's enormous. That's where the future's probably going to be. So this is just an example of using artificial intelligence. And I wanted to just see a couple things. I wanted to see how natural the, the baby's face looked, uh, how it could respond to the questions that he asked, uh, it, it, so that you start to understand how far along we're starting to get with artificial intelligence. And so if you start mixing some of the things that are coming, like virtual reality and artificial intelligence and you know, AR, augmented reality, and now you start being high beam, it's an interesting picture of how gaming will change. And if you talk about that inflection point, like what's going to cause the inflection point in the gaming space, I think it's going to be technologies like this. Technologies that can create a human-like system, right, but it's basically software that, that allow people to experience gaming in a completely different way. And let's talk about VR and AR and then AI. Right? So, so you just saw artificial intelligence, which is we can, we can allow a machine to start acting more and more human-like, and obviously we're getting better and better at that. Uh, you're hearing a lot today about chatbots, for example. Chatbots are just, uh, you know, like Siri, right? The, the capability for a machine to act as if it's a human and to talk to you. But, but mix that concept with virtual reality where now you're using some kind of device that you can put on. I mean, these are big and awkward, but that's where they currently are today, but they'll get better and better. They'll get smaller and lighter. But when you have this device on, obviously it creates a whole different reality than what you're seeing. And it's, it's kind of interesting. There's a, a game show in Japan now where they have them put on these VR devices, and then they project something that's very scary. And so in the first, uh, the first one they had in Japan, they projected somebody walking out on a plank over a 40-story building. So what they were seeing, like this, was that they were walking out on this plank, right, in front of this, with this 40-story drop. And the, and the whole game show is they film the people to see if they can actually do it. And it's so amazing because what you're seeing as the viewer is, is a woman with this headset on in a studio, right? And she's walking, and, and she's going like this, and, and then when she goes to fall, she screams. Because what she's seeing is a completely different reality than what you're seeing. And then, of course, the big joke is, you know, laughing at all the people who are so scared, right, when there's nothing to be scared of. But that's VR, virtual reality. Now, you start thinking, well, what happens when we mix virtual reality with AI so now not only are you in an alternate universe, or we can put you in a casino anywhere in the world. Anywhere in the world we can put you in a casino that's anywhere else in the world. And then we can have you interface with people, but they're not people. They're software. So I mean, we're very close to having all that kind of capability. Obviously, there's people already playing with this. Then add on things like AR, right? Augmented reality. Just so you understand, make sure everyone understands. Augmented reality is I can see all of you but I'm wearing some device or I'm looking through something that is adding data or adding something to this room. And so with AR, I could look at you, and I don't know who you are, but if I were to think profile, right, boom, your profile pops over my head, your head, right? And so your profiles would be there so I could see what your names are. That would be a, a form of augmented reality. We're adding some type of data or information to what we're looking at. Now, 
I'm sure most of you saw that we had this kind of very much flash in the pan, Pokemon Go. And if you didn't hear about Pokemon Go, it would have been difficult because it was everywhere for about three, four weeks. But Pokemon Go was one of the first kind of crude AR games. And so you walked around places and the characters literally were floating. And then you would go and if you got close to those characters, you could get that character. And you know, that's just gamey. I mean, it's just a game, but the interesting thing about it was you could set up lures. So you could set up some lures if you wanted to attract gamers to your business. And so there were some interesting aspects of Pokemon Go, but that was AR, right? Augmented reality. I still looked at the room. It's just that there was a character floating in the back. And if I got close to that character, then I could put that character in my inventory. So we're going to one more time try this, how smart is your neighbor? So you're stuck again, right, sitting there by yourself. You have to just think big thoughts. But here's what I want you to do. Again, I'm going to give you just a minute or so. I just want you to turn to your neighbor, and you can't use any of the ideas that that I give you. I just want you to try to tell them, what do you think VR and AR is going to do in the gaming space? Right? Turn to your neighbor, give them some idea if you got one. Go. Go. All right, let me ask you a question. I'm just curious, when you were talking about this, for example, if you look at AR, if you understand that we're we're gonna move into a world where we're gonna have augmented reality, where it's gonna be very common for somebody to have some device that allows them to see data floating, right, or see information that doesn't exist in the physical world, if you know we're gonna get that, which we are, Once we have AR, how is that going to change the casino experience? Because what happens when I'm playing blackjack, and the whole time I'm playing blackjack, the odds, right, because I can see the cards around the table, so all I have to do is look at the cards around the table, and the odds are floating in front of me telling me what I should do, because AR is going to be able to do that. And so what are you going to do? Are you going to say, well, no one's allowed to wear their glasses? Oh, yeah, don't act like you, you, like I heard that idea from you. Now, it's, it, these are the kinds of things to think about, right? You know, in school, I've always been fascinated by this. In school, when I was a kid, we were not allowed to bring calculators to school. They were banned. Now, by the time I was a junior or senior in high school, they were mandatory, right? Then you had to bring a calculator. My son had a laptop, and he wasn't allowed to take his laptop to school. And then, you know, by the time he's out of school, he had to have a laptop at school. And then my youngest daughter... She had to put her mobile device in a basket when she walked into class because she wasn't allowed to hold her mobile device when she went into class. And and then I look at people today, and they've got wearables on, and I'm saying to the teachers, are you going to make them all take their watches off too? And they're like, yeah, we will if we have to. We don't want any cheating. It's like, well, don't you understand that you think it's cheating, and then five years later it's mandatory? So think about that, right? In the casinos... When I have a device that's calculating odds, right, or that's giving me all kinds of data, that today you would say that's cheating. In the future, will it be almost mandatory that I've got to have that? I mean, th- this is being high beam, right? This is trying to understand how technology is going to change what you do in the future so that you can get out in front of it. 
Here's, here's the reason why that's critical. In the consulting work that we do, um, we're often trying to get clients to adhere to what we call the two-year rule, right? 18 months to two years. You want to be 18 months to two years in front of your competitors with how you use technology. And so if you think about the, that there's a continuum, right? At one end is the, is the uh, bleeding edge. We're spending a bunch of money and we're not getting much value out of it. At the other end is the laggards, the people who go last. And then there is the herd, right, when, when everybody else does it, right, the herd. What, what we're always trying to get leaders to understand is you need to be leading edge. Now, there are some people that will say to me this fast follower thing. They'll be like, well, we like to be a fast follower, right? We like to let somebody else be bleeding edge, and then we're the fast follower. I understand the concept. I will just warn you. Sometimes, if you're in an industry that is slower than other industries, and you think you're a fast follower, you're still six, seven years behind what other people are doing, what Starbucks or Amazon or other folks are doing. So you've got to pick where you want to be. Now, again, we look at this in terms of time. So when a new technology concept exhibits itself, how long does it take you to get this into the market? A great example of this for us was when we saw mobile, mobile apps. When we got mobile apps, it was pretty obvious that people were going to love mobile apps. But it was interesting how long it took some organizations to actually build a mobile app. And in a lot of cases, they let a competitor build a mobile app that to this day is the number one app in the industry. So if you're, for instance, Home Depot and Lowe's, one of you is going to go first. One of you is going to build a better mobile app. And then you're going to build more loyalty because of that, that mobile app. All right, there's also the bleed factor. So obviously, the farther out you get on this, the more you're going to bleed a little bit. Because if you want a lead on your competitors, you have to experiment. You have to take chances. Now, if we would say that bleeding edge means that half of all your money is wasted, in other words, half of what you spend on technology doesn't come back to you when you're trying to do new things, that's bleeding. But understand, if you want a two-year lead on your competitors, you'll have to bleed some amount. And so we tend to say it's probably around 15%. In other words, you're pioneering enough things that 15% of what you pioneer doesn't pay off. And so I just want you to think about, understand this model. Because if you look at it from a risk standpoint, some leaders look at it this way. They say, oh, well, there's no risk if we wait till everybody else does it. And there's all kinds of risk if we go first. When the truth is, there's a lot of risk if you let your competitors beat you with technology. You know, what, what we want for you is to have what we call the digital halo. Right? The digital halo is, you know, you're, you're a hotel, right? but everyone knows that you're the hotel that has the best technology. Best technology for check-in, best technology to order food, best technology to do a lot of things. That's called having a technology halo, and that's what, that's what you should seek to have. But again, if we talk about leadership, this is the, the zone, right, where leaders' decisions are made, whether you decide to not do something until the crowd does it or you decide to have a two-year lead. This is where leaders are made during a digital transformation. All right, so if you think about it this way, the technology, this, this time of transformation provides a huge technology palette of things that you can go do. Right? And I've mentioned to you, leaders tend to be moving too slow. There tends to be a gap. Right? And, and if we just looked at some of the things on the palette today, right? some of these things I've already mentioned, but they're, they're, this is just a basic list of some of the major things that are on the palette today that are going to be massively transformative. And if you look at all these things and you add them up, look at the bottom one. And I told you that story right off the bat from the steel company. Every new technology that we're creating is also creating a weakness in our ability to be secure. And so cybersecurity is getting to be a more and more dangerous topic, which I'm sure all of you are aware. It is getting to be routine, routine, that we hear about companies that have had millions of names stolen from their database. Routine. And man, we should not let that, that routineness lower, lower our zeal to actually understand we got to have better cybersecurity, especially in a space like gaming, where there's a lot of money and a lot of data. Because if there's any space that, that is going to come under massive attack, it's going to be a space like yours. 
And we've got to understand that right now the bad guys are winning. I mean, it's, the, good, the security people are struggling more and more to try to stop the bad guys from winning. And it's a lot because of the complexity, but it's also because there's a human element to technology. Like I showed you an example where there was a human being who wired that money out. They were able to socially engineer this controller, even though he had been told not to wire the money without verbal approval. I mean, there is a huge palette of things that you can use today, right? There's also a certain amount of danger. To, to use it, you've got to have a high amount of digital maturity. And so that's, you know, another word I haven't mentioned a lot, but a lot of the work that we do with companies is trying to get them to understand what is digital maturity? What is digital readiness? What does it mean to get your organization into a state where it's excellent with technology, right? Digital maturity. The last thing you got to understand probably about this is this palette gives you a ton of things. If you have digital maturity, you could use them. If you ask, what are we trying to do with technology? We'll always say, you're trying to amplify profits. Okay? And what I mean by amplify profits is there are two different things you can do with technology. We talk about technology being a tool and a weapon. As a tool, technology helps you lower costs. So it automates your back office, right? Or it automates things that you're doing. It does that replacing of humans that we talked about, right? It lowers costs. And then the other thing that it can do is it can raise your top line revenue. I and mean, that's what digital marketing is. And so we talk about like the, the goal for digital transformation and for digital maturity is to learn how to lower your costs at the same time that you're raising revenues with technology. And if you do both of those things at the same time, Right? It has a huge impact on the bottom line. So these are, this, is, this comes from a study that was done by MIT Sloan and Capgemini. And they went out and they found 600 companies, not technology companies, right? Just traditional types of companies, all different sizes. And they studied them as far as how well they use technology. And they put them into these quadrants. So, so the, the beginners are people who don't really know what to do with technology, and even if they did, they move way too slow. The fashionistas, they don't know what to do with technology, but they move fast. So in other words, the fashionistas are, are, are folks that they read about something in a magazine, or they read about something online, and they're like, we got to have this. And so they're the ones who call me, and they go, dude, dude, we need some big data. you got to hook us up with some big data. And I'll say, well, what would you do with it? And they go, oh, we need it. I just read an article in Fortune magazine. It says everybody's moving to big data. Could you score us some big data? That's a fashionista. Right? Even if they wrote the check and got it, they wouldn't know what to do with it. And then you've got the conservatives. They make really good decisions slow. So their, their mantra in the world, we go seventh. That's their mantra. We go seventh. They want to wait till everybody else does it, but they make good decisions. And then you've got the digerati, right? The, the companies who understand how to use technology and they move with, to get that two-year lead. Now, what you see up here are the financial results. So when they studied their balance sheets and their P&Ls, they were able to pull, if you look at revenue generation, digerati plus 9%. Interesting thing is fashionistas are plus 6 because they have a digital halo because they bought a lot of new stuff. But look at, the, uh, look at the profitability for fashionistas, minus 11. So in other words, they bought a lot of new stuff. It was impressive to customers, but they really didn't know how to use it to be profitable. But if you look at that plus 26% number for Digerati, like that's probably the only number you need to know on this, this report. Uh, I mean, this is, this is just one of many studies that are showing if you get digital maturity, it has a huge financial impact on the organization. If you want to win in the gaming space, there's a lot of things you got to do right. And there's a ton of things you got to do right. One of the things you have to do right is you have to understand what to focus your technology on. Half of it on automating and lowering costs, half of it on the customer front end. And how do we build better, stronger relationships with customers? How do we find more customers? Digital maturity. I mean, just a, a couple comments about that. Dig, digital maturity is not something that you get because you're an older organization. You've been around for a while. Okay, digital maturity is because you have put the skills and talents and the culture into an organization 
to be able to leverage what's going on in the transformation. That's what digital maturity is. Now, let me just t- show you. When, when we go in and we give people a grade card on digital maturity, I'm just going to show you what the grade card looks like. All right? There's nine things we score on. So think about like math, uh, history, and science. Here's what we do. We go in and we grade on leadership and digital readiness. How smart are your leaders and how digitally ready have they gotten the organization? So that's one grade. Then we go on and we grade uh, your workforce, so your, your IT people, your vendors, your contractors. How, how talented are they? How skilled are they? How, how well are they building right, your digital plumbing? Then we're going to go on and we're going to look at how well can you design? So today, when you're buying software and bolting it together, when you're building data warehouses or data lakes, when you're, do, you're doing design, and so how well can you design your technology empire for the future? Then we're going to go on and look at your, what are called systems of engagement and systems of record, right? This is all your software and hardware that, that systems of engagement is front end, so everything a customer would touch. Systems of record is everything back office. So we're going to look at your architecture and see how well have you built this digital plumbing. Then we're going to look at your ability to leverage the technology you already have. So do you have everything that you should have, and are you using what you have? And the sad thing here is when we give grades on this, this typical grade is that you're using what you already have at about 40%. I mean, you're only using 40% of the capabilities of the software you've already bought. Then we're going to look at your data maturity. How well are you using data as a weapon in the market or using data to to be enlightened and have insight? Then we're going to look at your organizational risk and control. In other words, cybersecurity, how you're offsetting that risk, how you're doing your disaster recovery, how you're doing with that risk. There's a number of areas that we're going to look at as far as how you're offsetting risk. And then the last thing that we're going to look at is just where are you in the market compared to your competitors when it comes to technology? Are you number one, two, three, four, five? I mean, where are you if we stack you up against your competitors with how well you can do technology? That's the grade card. If you want to know what digital maturity is, that's what it is. And so that's the interesting question, right, is inside your organization, what kind of grade card would you get? Now, obviously, if you get digital maturity, if you can just build that into your your organization, it creates an environment where technology flourishes. You don't have to force it to happen. It's just if you've built the environment, right, then technology flourishes. That's digital maturity. So, let, so let, me, let me wrap up uh, by, I guess, just saying you know, to, to each of you, I'd like, I'd like you to think about what's your legacy going to be and what is your legacy going to be. So each of us is going to finish out our careers during this digital transformation. I'm going to finish mine out, and I know exactly what the legacy is I want to have on the world. I'll tell you more about that in a second. But I I really would like you to be thoughtful going forward, like the rest of the day, the rest of the week. What is your legacy going to be? I mean, in your area that you work, what is it that you can do with technology that's going to leave a legacy? In 20 or 30 years, what systems will people still be using that you designed? What will be your legacy? Because I'll I'll tell you, when any of you retire, when you retire, they're going to tell a story. Right? And, and, and it's going to be one of two things. Right? They're either going to say, oh my gosh, how can we live without this person? They've done such a fantastic job of bringing technology in and, and building what they built. What are we going to do without them? Or they're going to say, thank God he is gone. He's been an anchor on this company for the last five years. I can't wait till he leaves so we can get a new younger person to catch the falling knife and save us. This is what will happen when you retire. Right? So think about what you want that legacy to be because you have the blessing of living through this digital transformation. And that's a, it's a very interesting opportunity for you. But man, don't waste it. All right, as I told you, if you want a copy of this presentation, I'll give you a couple options. If you want to go old school, you can just stop me sometime later today and give me a business card and I'll send it to you. Or if you want to go to our website at fpov.com, my initials are SK, this, this will be listed, and you just click on this and uh, we'll send it to you. 
All right, so two different ways if you want a copy of this. And I'm not kidding, if, you, if this content will help you at all, please get it and use it. I don't really care about the content. I don't, I'm not proprietary, you know, I don't care about it that way. If, it, it'll, if it'll be helpful to you, I want it to be helpful to you. All right, so my legacy, I'm gonna spend the rest of my life trying to get people to understand the impact of technology on humanity. So this is a book I just came out with, I just wrote, it took me three years to research and write this. And this book is all about how is technology impacting the human race. And so if you have an interest in that, you know, I would just encourage you to read this sometime because it starts with television and what did television do to us? And it goes all the way to transhumanism. And what is it gonna look like if we get, if we get to be transhuman? And the whole point of the book is trying to get us to understand what is the impact of technology on the economy, but on society. What's it going to be like for our grandkids and their grandkids? And are we going to be happy with what it's doing to us? That's one of the big things to understand. If you will accept that we're in the middle of this 50-year time of a digital transformation and that we get to live through the middle of it, one of the other things to ask yourself is, so what can you do? Again, what's your legacy? What can you do to make sure we have a more positive outcome and that we don't have that dystopian matrix terminator, right, view of the, of the future? All right, I've got a couple of workshops I'm teaching later today, just so you know. There's one on data, there's one on customer journey mapping and how to use digital tools to, to build better customer relationship journeys. And so if anybody's interested in those two subjects, I could see you later on today sometime. All right, thank you. Have a good rest of the day.